We've just seen how the logic language works and how rules work. Now let's turn to a, a more profound question. What do these things mean? That brings us to the, the subtlest, most devious part of this whole query language business. And that is that it's not quite what it seems to be. And and or and not and the logical implication of rules are not really the and and or and not and logical implication of logic. Let me give you an example of that. Certainly, if we have two things in logic, it ought to be the case that uh, and of, of P and Q is the same as and of Q and P, and that or of P and Q is the same as or of Q and P. But let's, let's look here. Here's an, uh, here's an example. Let's talk about somebody outranking somebody else in this in our little database organization. We'll say S is outranked by B if or if either the supervisor of S is B or there's some middle manager here that the supervisor of S is M and M is outranked by B. Right, so there's one way to define rule at rank by. Or we can write exactly the same thing, except at the end, at the bottom here, we reversed the order of these two clauses. And certainly, if this were logic, those ought to mean the same thing. However, in our particular implementation, if you say something like, like who's outranked by bin bitdel, what you'll find is that this rule will work perfectly well and generate answers whereas this rule will go into an infinite loop. And the reason for that is that this one will come in and say, oh, who's outranked by, by Ben Bitdiddle? Find an S. Find an S which is outranked by B where B is Ben Bitdiddle, which is going to have in it a subproblem. Oh, gee, find an M such that M is outranked by, by Ben Bitdiddle with no restrictions on M. So this will say, in order to solve this problem, I solve exactly the same problem. And then after I've solved that, I'll check for a supervisor relationship. Whereas this one won't get into that, because before it tries to find this outranked by, it'll already have had a restriction on M here. Right, so these two things, which ought to mean the same, in fact, one goes into an infinite loop, one goes, one does not. Uh, that's a very extreme case of a general thing that you'll find in logic programming that if you start changing the order of the things in ands or ors, you'll find tremendous differences in efficiency. And we just saw you know, an infinitely big difference in efficiency, an infinite loop. And there are similar things having to do with the order in which you enter rules the order in which it happens to look at rules in the database may vastly change the efficiency with which it gets out answers or, in fact, send it into an infinite loop for some orderings. And this, is, this whole thing has to do with the fact that you're checking these rules in some order. And some rules may lead to really long paths of implication. Others might, others might not. And you don't know a priori which ones are good and which ones are bad. And there's a whole bunch of research having to do with that mostly having to do with thinking about making parallel implementations of logic programming languages. And in some sense, what you'd like to do is check all rules in parallel. And whichever ones sort of get answers, you bubble them up. And if some go down infinite deductive change, well, you just, you know, memory is cheap and processors are cheap, and you just let them buzz for as long as you want. There's a deeper problem, though, in comparing, comparing this logic language to language to real logic. The, the example I just showed you, it uh, went into an infinite loop, maybe, but at least it didn't give the wrong answer. There's an actual deeper problem when we start comparing, you know, seriously comparing this logic language with real classical logic. So let's, let's sort of review some real classical logic. Uh, let's see. I'd say all humans are mortal. Right, so that's pretty classical logic. And then maybe we'll continue in the, in the very best, best classical tradition. We'll say uh, all 
All right, so make it really classical. All Greeks are human. Right, and which has the syllogism go. Socrates is a Greek. And then what do you write here? I think three dots. Well, classical logic. Therefore, when the syllogism, Socrates is mortal. Okay, so there's some there's some real honest classical logic. Let's let's compare that with a classical logic database. All right, so here's a classical logic database. Socrates is a Greek, Plato's a Greek, Zeus is a Greek, and Zeus is a god. And uh, any all humans are mortal. Right? To show that something is mortal, it's enough to show that it's human. All humans are fallible. And uh, all Greeks are human is not quite right. This says that all Greeks who are not gods are human. Right? So to show something's human, it's enough to show it's a Greek and not a god. And the address of any Greek god is Mount Olympus. Right, so there's a little little classical logic database, and indeed that would work work fairly well if we go up if we type that in and say, uh, you know, is Socrates mortal or Socrates fallible or mortal? It'll say yes. Is Plato mortal and fallible? It'll say yeah. Yes. If we say is Zeus mortal? It won't find anything. Right, and it'll work perfectly well. However, suppose we want to extend this. Let's define what it means for someone to be a perfect being. I don't know if you will say rule. A perfect being and I think this is right. If you're up on your medieval scholastic philosophy, I believe that perfect beings are ones who were neither mortal nor fallible. So and not mortal X not fallible x. All right, so we'll define the system to teach it what a perfect being is. And now what we're going to do is uh, ask for the address of all the perfect beings. So and the address of x is y, and x is perfect. Okay, so what we're generating here is the world's most exclusive mailing list. Right, the address of all the perfect beings. We might have typed this in, or we might type in this. We'll say and perfect of x and the address of x is y. Well, suppose we type all that in. And we try this query. This query is going to give us an answer. This query will say, yeah, Mount Olympus. This query, in fact, is going to give us nothing. It'll say, no addresses of perfect beings. Now, why is that? Why is there a difference? This is not an infinite loop question. This is a different answer question. Reason is that if you remember the implementation of not not acted as a filter. Not said, I'm going to take some possible dictionaries, some possible frames, some possible answers, and filter out the ones that happen to satisfy some condition, and that's how I implement not. If you think about what's going on here, I'll build this query box where an address piece, the output of an address piece gets fed into a, into a perfect piece. What will happen is, the address piece will set up some things of everyone whose address I know. Those will get filtered by the knots inside perfect here. So I'll throw out the ones which don't happen to be, which happen to be either mortal or fallible. In the other order, what happens is I set this up, start it up with an empty frame. The perfect in here doesn't find any things for the knots to filter, so nothing comes out here at all. Right? And that's, there's sort of nothing there that gets fed into the address thing. So there I don't get an answer. And, the re and the, again, the reason for that is not isn't generating anything. Not's only throwing out things. 
And if I never start it up with anything, there's nothing for it to throw out. So out of this thing, I get the wrong answer. How can you fix that? Well, there are ways to fix that. So you might say, well, that's just sort of stupid. Why, why are you just doing all your not stuff at the, at the beginning? The right way to implement not is to realize that when you have conditions like, like not, you should generate all your answers first. And then with each of these dictionaries, pass along, gee, at the very end, I'll do filtering. And there are, implica there are implementations of logic languages that work like that, that solve this particular problem. However, there's a more profound problem, which is, which one of these is the right answer? Is it Manolipus or is it nothing? So you might say, you might say it's Manolipus because, after all, Zeus is in that database. And Zeus was neither mortal nor fallible. All right, so you might say Zeus ought to satisfy not, say not, mortal Zeus, or not fallible Zeus. But let's actually look at that database. Let's look at it. There's no way. How does it know that Zeus is not fallible? There's nothing in there about that. What's in there is that humans are fallible. Right? How does it know that Zeus is not mortal? There's nothing in there about that. It just said, I don't have any rule. Which, See, the only way I can do something's mortal is if it's human, and that's all it really knows about mortal. And in fact, if you remember your, your classical mythology, you know that the Greek gods were mortal, were not mortal, but fallible. Right, so the answer is, is not in, in the rules there. See, why does it deduce that? Right, see, Socrates would certainly not have made this error of logic. What not means in this language is, is not not. It's not the not of logic. What not means in this language is not deducible from things in the database as opposed to not true. And that's a very big difference. Subtle, but big. So in fact, this is perfectly happy to say not anything that it doesn't know about. So if you ask it, is it not true that Zeus likes chocolate ice cream, it'll say, sure, it's not true. Or anything else, anything it doesn't know about. Right? Not means, means not deducible from the things you've told me. And a world where you're identifying not deducible with, in fact, not true, this is called the closed world assumption. Closed world assumption. Anything that I cannot deduce from what I know is not true. Right? If I don't know anything about x, then x isn't true. That's very dangerous. See, from a logical point of view, first of all, it doesn't really make sense. Because if I don't know anything about x, I'm willing to say not x. But am I willing to say not not x? Well, sure, I don't know anything about that either, maybe. So not not x is not necessarily the same as x, and so on and so on and so on. So there's, no, there's some sort of funny bias in there. Right, so that's, that's sort of funny. The second thing, if you start building up you know, real reasoning programs based on this, I mean, think how dangerous that is. Right, you're saying, right, right, you're saying I know I'm in a position to deduce everything true that's relevant to this problem. So I'm, I'm reasoning, and built into my reasoning mechanism is the assumption that anything that I don't know can't possibly be relevant to this problem. Right? There are a lot of big, you know, a lot of big organizations that work like that. Right? Right? Most, uh, right? Most corporate marketing divisions work like that. And you know the, you know the consequences of that. Right? So it's very dangerous to start really typing in these big logical implication systems. And, and going on what they say, because they have this really limiting assumption built in. Right, so you have to be very, very careful about that. And that's a deep problem. That's not a problem about we can make a little bit cleverer implementation and do the filters and organize the, the infinite loops to make them go away. It's a different kind of problem. It's a different semantics. So 
I think, I think to wrap this up, it's fair to say that logic programming, I think, is, is a terrifically exciting idea. I mean, the idea that you, you can bridge this gap from the imperative to the declarative, that you can start talking about relations and really get tremendous power by, by going above the abstraction of what's my input and what's my output and link to logic. The problem is it's, it's a, a goal that I think has yet to be realized. And probably one of the, you know, the very, very most interesting research questions going on now in languages is how do you somehow make a real logic language? And secondly, how do you bridge the gap from this world of logic and relations to the worlds of, to the worlds of more traditional languages and somehow combine the power of both? Okay, let's break. Uh, couldn't you solve that last problem by having extra rules that, that implied? I mean, the problem here is you have the definition of something, but you don't have the definition of its opposite. If right. you include in the database something that says right. uh, something implies mortal x, something else implies not mortal yes. x, haven't you basically solved the problem? The qu but the issue is, do you put a finite number of those in? If you're... If, if things are specified always in pairs. But, but the question is then what do you do about deduction? So you, so you can't specify knots. But the problem is in a big system, it turns out that might not, might not be a finite number of things. I, there, there, I are also, there are also two, there's sort of two issues. Partly it might not be finite. Partly it might be, it's not what you want. So for a good example would be, suppose I want to do connectivity. I want to reason about connectivity. And I tell you, I'm going to tell you, there's four things, A and B and C and D. And I'll tell you, A's connected to, D, A's connected to B and uh, C's connected to D. And now I'll tell you, is A connected to D? Right, that's the question. There's an example where I would like something like the closed world assumption. That's a tiny toy, but a lot of times I want to be able to say something like, anything that I haven't told you assume is not, is not true. So it's not as simple as you only want to put in explicit knots all over the place. It's that sometimes it really isn't clear what you, what you even want. That having to specify both everything and not everything is too precise, and then you get down into, into problems there. But there are, there are a lot of approaches that you know, that explicitly put in knots and reason based on that. So it's a very good idea. It's just that, it's just that then it starts becoming a little cumbersome in the very large problems you'd like to use. I'm not sure how, how directly related to your argument this is, but one of your points was that, uh, that one of the dangers with a closed world is you never really know all the things that are there. You never really know all the parts to it. Isn't that a major problem with any programming? I always write programs where I, I assume that I've got all the cases, and so I check right. for them all or whatever, and then I, somewhere down the road I find out that I didn't check for one of them. Well, well, sure it's true, but the problem here is it's that assumption which is the thing that you're making if you believe you're identifying this with logic. So you're, you're quite right. It's a, it's a situation you're never in. The problem is if you're starting to believe that what this is doing is logic and you look at the rules you write down and say, what can I deduce from them? You have to be very careful to remember that not means something else. And it means something else based on an assumption which is probably not true. So. Do I understand you correctly that you cannot fix this problem without killing off all possibilities of inference through altering not? So without... So no, that's not, quite, that's not quite right. There are, other, there are ways to do logic of real knots. There are actually ways to do that, but they're very inefficient as far as anybody knows. And they're much more... They don't... The, the quote inference in here is built into this unifier and this pattern matching unification algorithm. There are ways to automate real logical reasoning but it's not based on that. And logic programming languages don't tend to do that because it's very inefficient, as far as anybody knows. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Thank you.